Suspense, which is heard on Thursday nights at this hour, is taking its customary summer holiday. Suspense returns to the air eight weeks from now on Thursday, August 31st. Ladies and gentlemen, a $5,000 reward will be offered each week on the program immediately following this announcement. You out there, you who think you've committed the perfect crime, the perfect murder, that there are no clues, no witnesses, that your identity is unknown, listen. Somebody knows. Yes, you, wherever you may be, no matter where you're hiding... Somewhere, sometime, someone listening to this program is going to bring you to justice. Yes? Somebody knows. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Somebody Knows. A program conceived in the public interest, dedicated to aiding the forces of law and order in the solution of this nation's unsolved crime. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to recreate for you tonight all the known facts in an actual unsolved murder. Somewhere, someone among you has had contact with the killer or killers. Someone whose identity need never be known has seen evidence or possesses information that can lead to the solution of this crime. In the public interest, the Columbia Broadcasting System offers a $5,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer in this unsolved murder. We ask you then to please listen carefully, for you may be the one to win this reward. Somebody knows. It may be you. And now we open the files on one of this nation's unsolved murders. It's homicide file number DR-75-4613 of the Los Angeles, California Police Department. The unsolved murder of Mrs. Gladys Kern. It is St. Valentine's Day, Saturday, February 14th, 1948. The time is between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The place, the exclusive Los Feliz residential section in the hills high above the city of Los Angeles, California. A real estate agent is showing a prospective buyer through a vacant home at 4217 Cromwell Avenue. Now, here's the dining room. As you can see, it's designed for good, homey, comfortable living and yet large enough to accommodate a good-sized dinner party. And this way is the kitchen. Now, maybe as a man, you aren't interested in what makes a kitchen practical. <laughs> but if you're like my husband, you're certainly interested in what comes out of it. So I'd just like to point out a few of... What's the matter? Why are you looking at me that... That knife? What are you doing with that knife? No! No, you can't! You... No! No! <laughs> On Sunday morning, February 15, 1948, a red light winks on a switchboard in the Los Angeles Police Department. Missing Persons Bureau. Hello? Is this where you report a, a missing person? That's right, sir. Well, my name is Jack Kern. It's my mother. She... Well, well, ever since yesterday, we haven't any idea what happened to her. I see. What's your mother's name, Mr. Kern? Mrs. Gladys Kern. Mrs. Gladys Kern. Yes, sir. And the address? 6200 Roy Street in, in Highland Park. 6200 Roy Street, Highland Park. Now, if you give me a detailed description of other the party you At about the same moment that Mrs. Gladys Kern is being reported missing, a sergeant enters an office in the homicide division. Say, uh, here's something you might be interested in, Lieutenant. Oh? Huh? What is it, Sergeant? A note, anonymous. It was picked up in a mailbox at Fifth and Olive. Looks like it might be something for homicide. Has the crime lab seen it? Just got through with it. He said, bring it down here. All right, let's see what it says. The note is written on a plain piece of paper folded over. On the outside, penciled in large, scrawling letters, are three words. Hurry to police. 
The body of the note, also printed in clumsy, penciled letters, is literary phrase, badly spelled and unpunctuated. It says, I made acquaintance of man three weeks ago. He said he wanted to buy a home for his family, but he was a racketeer. Well, he was a racketeer, racketeer no oh, real yeah. estate who would do business with him. He suggested I buy a home for him in my name, and then he would go with me to look at a property to make sure he liked it. They went into the house, and I waited outside. After a while, I went up to investigate. She was laying on the floor. I turned her over. I was covered with blood. I pulled a knife out of her, and then I left and ran. I knew this man as Louis Fraser. He's about, about five foot ten, has jet black curly hair, wears blue or tan gabardine suits. He told me he was a fighter, and he looks it. I won't rest till I find him, because I know that man is my only alibi. alibi. Without Without him, I feel equally guilty. Hmm. What do you think, Lieutenant? A crank? I doubt it, Sergeant. I think this man has described an actual crime. Monday morning, February 16th, 1948, Mr. Fred Lyon, a realtor with offices at 2144 Hillhurst Avenue is showing homes to two women prospects, one of whom is Mrs. Verdi F. Cross, a trained nurse. One of the homes on his list is located at 4217 Cromwell Avenue in the Los Feliz Hills. At the moment, Mr. Lyon and the two women are looking over the grounds at the Cromwell Avenue address. And as you can see, ladies, the property's been well kept up. The owner spared no pains to maintain his home in keeping with the section. Personally, I feel that at $25,000, the property's very sound value. The two women and Mr. Lyon now, leave the grounds and enter the service porch. They walk slowly toward the kitchen door. Then, as they're about to enter the kitchen... Oh, what is it? What's the matter, dear? There, on the kitchen floor. Look through that open door. Good Lord. Wait a minute. Stay here. Mrs. Verdi F. Cross, the nurse, walks a few feet into the kitchen... She stands there a moment, looking down, and then comes back to Mr. Lyon and the other woman. You needn't go any further. That woman is dead. A few minutes later, in the police communication division, a monitor on a police complaint switchboard plugs in to answer a call. Los Angeles Police Department, complaint division. You're certain the woman's dead? All right, what's the address? 4217 Cromwell Avenue. And your name? Mr. Fred Lyon. Who's with you, Mr. Lyon? Very well, sir. Go back to the house. Don't touch anything. You and the two women... As the monitor talks to Mr. Lyon over the telephone, he plugs in the homicide division switchboard on the same line. Simultaneously, he writes the pertinent information on a form, rips it from its pad, and places it on an endless chain conveyor belt that carries it into the next room. The next room is the broadcasting room of KGPL, official radio station of police communications. The dispatcher takes the slip and hands it to one of the seven broadcasters sitting fan-shaped around him. She looks it over quickly and presses a button on the microphone before her. Code 2, a dead body at 4217 Cromwell Avenue. Code 2, a dead body at 4217 Cromwell Avenue. Cars 301 and 115 acknowledge. Within a matter of minutes after the flash is given, Detective A.W. Hubka arrives on the scene. His official report, as given to the Homicide Division and later at the coroner's inquest, contains in part the following information. In response to the Code 2 broadcast, I proceeded at once to the home at 4217 Cromwell Avenue. In the kitchen, I found the body of an attractively dressed woman lying face down on the floor. My examination satisfied me that she was dead. There was a deep wound in her back between the shoulder blades. Obvi- obviously a knife wound. In the kitchen sink, I found a leather handle hunting knife with a blade of about uh, six inches in length. An attempt had been made to wash it clean, though some traces of blood stains still remain. Also in the sink was a man's balled-up handkerchief, which bore stains that I presume to be blood. Beside the body lay an open purse and a wallet. Within a short time, a detail arrived from the Shortly after the discovery of the murder, information is correlated between the Missing Persons Bureau and the Homicide Division. A police card speeds to Highland Park and picks up Mr. John E. Kern, husband of Mrs. Gladys Kern, reported missing the day before. It takes him to 4217 Cromwell Avenue. A 
police officer leads the tense, anxious man toward the kitchen. This way, please, Mr. Kern. The body is here in the kitchen. Gladys. Gladys. Dear God. It's my wife, Gladys. My wife. My wife. In just a moment, we'll continue with file number DR75-4613 of the Los Angeles, California Police Department. The unsolved murder of Mrs. Gladys Kern. CBS invites you to hear another adventure in the far corners of the world with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, later tonight. Starring Hollywood actor Edmund O'Brien, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brings you the adventures of a top investigator for a large insurance company. Old hands who think they have a new twist and new hands who think they have a novel twist try to swindle Johnny Dollar's company, and Johnny has to keep one step ahead. For action, thrills, and adventure in the far places, listen to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Edmund O'Brien, every Thursday on most of these same CBS stations. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue with the rest of the factual information concerning the unsolved murder of Mrs. Gladys Kern. Remember, $5,000 reward will be paid for information leading to the arrest and conviction of her killer. With the establishment of the identity of the body at 4217 Cromwell Avenue as that of Mrs. Gladys Kern... All the resources of the Los Angeles, California Police Department swing into action in an effort to apprehend her killer. Detective Captain Burt Jones, Hollywood Division, is placed in charge of the investigation. The coroner's inquest is held at 1.30 p.m. Friday, February 21st, 1948. Deputy Coroner Edwin Lennox is presiding. The first witness to be called is Mr. John E. Kern, the dead woman's husband. Now, Mr. Kern, we'll try to make this as brief as possible for you. Would you tell us, please, if you know of anyone who could possibly have any reason for doing harm to your wife? Uh, will you talk into that hand microphone, please, so that we can all hear you? Go right ahead, please. My wife had absolutely no enemies that I know of. There was no reason why anyone should want to kill her. I see. When was the last time you saw her, Mr. Kern? Last time I saw her alive was about 5.30 Saturday morning when I left for work. Would you please tell us, in your own words, all that you can remember of your wife's activities on that day? Well, Gladys was up before dawn to fix my breakfast. She always did. I see. She was a good wife. Go on, please. I left for work about 5.30, returned home about 4.30 that afternoon. Was your wife at home then, Mr. Kern? No, sir. But she'd left a note for me. It was to remind me that we were going to a wedding. While waiting for his wife to return that night, Mr. Kern took a little nap. It was some time later that the doorbell rang. Uh, uh, Oh, the doorbell. It must be Gladys. Hi, Dad. Hello, Father. Oh, hello, kids. Come in. We've come to take you to the wedding, Dad. Where's Mom? Uh, guess she's not home yet, Peggy. Oh, that's too bad. We thought we'd all go together. Well, you know how your mother is, Jack. She's got a client on the string. Oh, here. I know. She's liable to come home at all hours. Uh, look, you two kids run along. I'll wait for her, and we'll show up later. All Still right. sweethearts, eh, Dad? <laughs> Can't move one step without the other. Well, I guess that's okay, this being St. Valentine's Day, but don't be late. This is going to be a night for the Kerns to howl. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Kern, uh, what did you have to do after your children left? Well, I wasn't worried about Gladys, as I'd told the kids. She was very often kept late closing a deal, so mm-hmm. I lay down again. It was Sunday morning before I woke up. Mrs. Kern hadn't come home, of course. No, sir. I was really scared then. I called the kids right away, and they hadn't heard from her either. Jack called the Missing Persons Bureau. We phoned everyone we could think of, and... Well, then we just waited. 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 
Meanwhile, the reports on preliminary investigation in the case are discouraging. Detective Captain Jones has only this information to offer. Uh, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> murder weapon, the leather-handled K-bar hunting knife, is the type widely sold in war surplus stores. A check has been made of each such store in the city without any concrete results. We are also urging the anonymous letter writer through the radio and press to turn himself in, work with the police. Uh, no response has been forthcoming to date. Chemist Ray Pinker of the Police Crime Laboratory has this to report. Uh, Mrs. Kern's purse of a black plastic material would hold no fingerprints unless applied by uh, wet or blood-covered fingers. We found none. Nor were there any prints in the wallet or the murder weapon. Anonymous note had passed through too many hands to provide us with anything of value. Then finally comes the first break in the case. A witness is found who saw Mrs. Kern on that fateful Saturday in the company of a strange man. The witness, Mrs. Mary Johnson, manager of a drugstore at North Vermont and Fountain Avenues. Why, yes, yes, officer. I saw Mrs. Kern on St. Valentine's Day. She came in here real often. Her real estate office is only a few doors away. You know, at uh, uh, 1307 North Vermont. Well, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'd say, that she came in. Oh, I was busy back here at the drug counter, so I didn't really pay much attention. But I did notice that there was a man with her. He was... What? Oh, no, no, I'd never seen him before. None of the others had either. They sat at the soda fountain and talked for a while, and well, then they left. That was the last time I ever saw poor Mrs. Kern. The man? Well, as near as I can recall, he was of medium build. He wore a, a dark blue suit. Yes, I remember now. He had very dark hair. Yes, very dark hair. Blue suit, very dark hair. What was it that anonymous note had said? I know this man is Louis Fraser. He's about five foot ten, has jet black curly hair. Wears a blue or tan gabardine suit. Then, two weeks later in Long Beach, California, just a few miles away, another event takes place that finds its way into the file on Mrs. Gladys Kern. In a real estate office at 4591 Banner Street, Mrs. Jack Landis is sitting at her desk checking property listings when the door opens. Hello there. Hi. You, uh, you got any houses for sale? <laughs> Should say we have. What kind of a house were you looking for? Uh, I'm not particular. I, um, nobody else in the office. Hmm, not at the moment, no, but I have all the listings. If you could give me some idea of... Does this give you some idea, lady? That knife. Well, what are you doing with that knife? You just keep your mouth shut. I ain't gonna do nothing with it. If you don't, I'll... All right, now. Let me have that purse. Quick, now. Yes. Of course. Here. Okay. Now, you just sit there and keep that mouth shut. Yes. You better not do anything for five minutes. I'll come back and I'm gonna take care of you. So long. Thank you. Oh, oh, answer. Oh, please answer. Operator, operator, get me the police. Hurry, get me the police. Now the pattern begins to grow clearer. Another real estate woman has been threatened and robbed by a prospective home buyer carrying a hunting knife. And now there's a more detailed description. A description that fits into the same general pattern that the police have been building. Attention all police officers. Wanted for questioning in the murder of Mrs. Gladys Kern, this man. Description follows. 23 to 26 years of age. 5 feet 7 to 10 inches tall. Handsome. Has black wavy hair neatly combed. Eyes dark brown, close set. Smooth shaven, features sharp, has Midwestern accent. May be dressed in blue gabardine slacks and a greenish blue zipper jacket or a pinstripe suit. May be driving a 1939 Chevrolet Coupe or a dark gray 1940 Dodge or Plymouth sedan. Will repeat, wanted for questioning. 
Now the police receive two more important bits of information. The first comes from Mr. William Osborne, a physicist who maintains offices in the rear of Mrs. Kern's realty office on Vermont Avenue. At about uh, 4 o'clock the afternoon of Saturday, February 14th, I happened to notice Mrs. Kern go into a real estate office with a man. He was in his 50s, about uh, 6 feet tall, weighed probably 200 pounds. His hair was graying and his face was, well, I would say rather lean. He had a New York appearance in his manner and his dress. He and Mrs. Kern were talking and joking and they left shortly after they'd come in. I'd never seen the man before and I never saw him again. The second bit of information, undoubtedly one of the most important clues in the entire case, came from Mrs. Peggy Ann Phillips, young married daughter of Mrs. Kern. When I was graduated from school, my brother Jack gave me a diamond wristwatch as a present. A short time before the day, before St. Valentine's Day, my mother took her watch to a jeweler for repair, and I gave her mine to wear meanwhile. She was wearing my watch on the day she was on St. Valentine's Day. When the police found her, the watch was gone. Oh, excuse me, please. My baby's crying. He, he loved his grandmother. Not... I'm sure he knows he, he's never going to see her again. Ladies and gentlemen, we've now given you all available information as contained in the files of the Los Angeles, California Police Department regarding the unsolved murder of Mrs. Gladys Kern. On the basis of that information, the coroner's jury said... We find the death of Mrs. Gladys Kern to be a homicide at the hands of person or persons unknown. Person or persons unknown? No. The killer of Mrs. Kern is not unknown. Somewhere in whatever town or city this man is hiding, some one of you has seen him today, has spoken to him, eaten lunch and dinner with him, driven in the same car that he used on the day of the murder... No, the cold-blooded killer who took Mrs. Kern's life is not a person who is unknown. Somebody knows. Now listen carefully, please. Listen, all of you, wherever you may be. We're going to give you a recapitulation of all the known facts in the unsolved murder of Mrs. Gladys Kern. Better make a note of them. And remember, by following the instructions we shall give you in a moment... You may be the one to earn a $5,000 reward. Now, here are the actual facts in the case. Mrs. Gladys Kern, 42 years of age, a realtor with offices at 1307 North Vermont Avenue in Los Angeles, California, was stabbed to death with a hunting knife in a vacant home at 4217 Cromwell Avenue in that city. The date? Saturday, St. Valentine's Day, February 14, 1948. The time? between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The motive was obviously robbery. Only a few pennies were found in a rifled purse. And a diamond-studded wristwatch she'd been wearing was missing. The police have descriptions of two men whom they're seeking as suspects in this crime. Here's a description of the first man. His age, between 23 and 26. 5 feet 7 to 10 inches tall. Handsome. Wavy black hair, neatly combed. Eyes... Dark brown, close set. Sharp features, smooth shaven. Has a Midwestern accent. And please remember that this man seems to have a preference for blue or tan gabardine suits. Now here's the description of the second man seen with Mrs. Kern on the day of her death. Age, in his fifties. About six feet tall. Weight, about two hundred pounds. Hair, turning gray. Face, rather lean has what is described as a New York appearance in his manner and dress. Now, the clue most likely to trap the man we're looking for is a diamond-studded wristwatch. Here's the description. Listen carefully, please. The watch is a boulevard. The case is yellow gold with a two-tone overlay of platinum. On each side, there are two or three diamond chips. The hands are black, spade type. The figures, Arabic on a white dial. The face opening of the watch is slightly oblong. And most important of all, on the back of the watch is this inscription. Peggy Ann, 6-1944. Let 
me repeat that, please. On the back of the watch is inscribed the name Peggy Ann and the figures 6 1944. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if any of you possesses information that may have bearing on the unsolved murder of Mrs. Gladys Kern, please follow these instructions so that your name and identity need never be made known unless you wish. Now listen carefully. Write your information on a plain sheet of paper. Do not sign your name. Instead, sign it with six numbers, any arrangement of any six numbers. Then tear off a blank corner of that paper with a ragged edge. Write the same six numbers on that corner and keep it. Mail the rest of the paper with the information to Somebody Knows, Hollywood, California. You need tell no one what you have done, nor will you have to appear in person. If the information you've supplied leads to the arrest and conviction of the killer of Gladys Kern, we'll announce your signature number on this program. Then, if you don't want your name to be known, go to your lawyer or doctor, your priest, minister, or rabbi, and have him present the torn corner of the paper to any CBS station. In this way, you won't have to appear in person. If the torn corner matches the original paper containing the information, the $5,000 reward will be yours. Remember, you, wherever you are, you whose name need never be known, you may earn a reward of $5,000. Next week, at the same time, we'll present another true case history of unsolved murder. Homicide file number 78654 of the St. Paul, Minnesota Police Bureau. The unsolved murder of Mary Agnes Kabiska. You out there. You who have murdered in cold blood and think you've gotten away with it. Listen. You cannot escape. There is no perfect crime. Remember, you are not unknown. Somebody knows. Tonight's case was written by Sidney Marshall from information in the files of the Los Angeles, California Police Department. Research was by Maurice Zim. Music was composed and played by Milton Charles. Somebody Knows is a James L. Safier production in association with CBS by arrangement with the Chicago Sun-Times and is based on a copyright owned by W.L. Finstad. It was narrated and directed by Jack Johnstone. In order to be eligible for the reward, letters containing information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer or killers of Mrs. Gladys Kern must be postmarked not later than midnight, July 26, 1950. Arrest of the guilty person or persons must occur within 90 days of that date, and conviction must be within one year of tonight's broadcast. If more than one person gives the information leading to conviction, our judges will divide the $5,000 reward among them in proportion to the importance the judges attach to the fact supplied. And in this, the decision of our judges will be final. Until next Thursday at the same time, this is Frank Goss saying good night for Somebody Knows. Excuse me, but have you met Ethelbert? Ethelbert is one of the constant joys of the CBS crime photographer shows. The others being the fast-paced action, the ingenious stories, and the trigger-quick thinking of Casey, the crime photographer himself. Stay tuned right now for Casey's latest adventure entitled Collision. This is CBS, where you hear Arthur Godfrey every weekday afternoon, the Columbia Broadcasting System.